Good morning. Hello. 
So glad to see all of you here today. Uh, this morning we're going to start off our worship time with a new song, so do you stand up and join me and try and sing it. <laughs> There's a grace when the heart is on fire. Another way when the walls are closing. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and the reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. Was another in the waters holding back the seas? And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears a burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. Nothing's in between. There'll be another in the fire, standing next to 
when he shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteous dress alone, faultless to stand before the Grace and peace to you uh, this morning. Just a couple things as we uh, uh, prepare to uh, share in Scripture together. Uh, the first thing that's most important is uh, my slides are not there. That is last week's sermon. I'm like way behind. We're going to preach last week's message because 
Hey, Kim, do you have my, is my, are my keys there with my USB? Here. You mind helping out, Ryan? I can preach for a while until our, uh, until our uh, sl- slides get there, so. All right, also there's no internet, so. <gasps> uh, the winter storm prepared us for this, right? No, 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 no internet? No, it didn't? <laughs> like, no, that was, a, that was a one-time thing, PJ. That's not supposed to happen. Not supposed to happen again, so. What's that, Steve? It's not the video guy this week. Steve wants everyone to know it's not the video. No, it was totally my fault. So our internet was uh, getting like just a trickle earlier. And so I uh, hopped over to our little closet where our internet stuff is and got on the phone with them to see if there's anything they could do. And I did that instead of uh, giving you sermon slides uh, for today. So the, uh, the second thing is the inside of your bulletin is upside down. All right. So uh, if you want to read it, you need to do a headstand so that you can uh, read it the right way or have one of your, have one of your kids do it. So uh, I'll give you an update on, uh, on Ferris uh, Nasser. So uh, last Wednesday, I was walking out of this building and Nasib uh, drove up. He had been in town for Easter uh, weekend uh, to hang out with the, this part of his family who's here. Uh, if, you, if you don't know, um, those of you who don't know the Nasser family, uh, Ferris, uh, their, their seven-year-old son or uh, that, uh, 10-year-old son, uh, 11? 11 uh, is, uh, they've been gone for seven months, okay? So uh, 11-year-old son, they've been in Cincinnati. He had bone marrow transplant two months ago. Uh, He's recovering uh, very well. Uh, Nasib came to spend Easter weekend here. May went to spend Easter weekend with Ferris, uh, who she hadn't been able to see in in many months. And then uh, May's sister came to spend the weekend with them at their house, since their uh, mother is living there also. Uh, But... um, uh, Nasib sent the, this update for our church family. Uh, by the grace of God, and after numerous delays due to infection, uh, blood pressure, and nausea management, uh, they were moved to outpatient uh, this last week. So that's a huge blessing. Yes, you can <laughs> praise God for that. <clears throat> So they've been seven months in the children's hospital. They've moved across the street to the Ronald McDonald house. Uh, and so they're going to the hospital for outpatient uh, uh, procedures that they need. Uh, but we're 66 days uh, from the transplant. The engraftment is moving well. Uh, 99% of the, of the blood marrow transplant is still there and active. So that's a really good sign. Um, uh, Nasib requests prayers. He's the outpatient nurse caring for Ferris. He says that it's intense because there's a lot of medication. Uh, his non- Nausea is still high, blood pressure is high, and, uh, and he's doing you know, the, the outpatient uh, work himself uh, after uh, hospital hours. So the road ahead is tough, but it's promising. Ferris is a true fighter and continues to be in, in good spirit. So I just want to give you that, that update uh, for them. It was really good to see Nasib in person there for a moment when he uh, drove up in our parking lot uh, last week. So uh, let's pray for them, uh, pray for us, uh, pray for our sermon slides, and then we'll get on with the, with the good stuff. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. We know that uh, every trial and, and difficulty that comes our way, Lord, that you are with us, that every, uh, every fire, every wave, every difficulty and turmoil that we see and experience in life, God, that you are right there with us, that you are guiding us to them and through them and out of them, Lord, and even in those moments that you're shining light on us so that we can shine light on others as well. Lord, I thank you for uh, just bringing uh, Ferris through these, uh, these last several months of, uh, of intense procedures and bone marrow transplant. Uh, we thank you for the health that you're providing for him and, uh, and the strength and, and the comfort that you're providing for their family as well. Uh, Lord, we ask uh, just your, your hand of rest and healing and blessing be upon their home and be upon their, their family. Uh, Lord, for all those uh, in our church family and congregation who are, uh, who are struggling, uh, who are uh, just uh, uh, having medical uh, difficulties and, uh, and beyond, Father, you know every need that we have, and we pray that you'd uh, supply those. Give us faith uh, as, we, uh, as we go day to day uh, to trust you and to live for you. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so we're going to be in Exodus uh, chapter 13. So you want to find Exodus chapter 13. This is the moment after Passover. So last week we looked at Passover and uh, the, the leaving Egypt uh, moment, huge moment in, uh, in the life of Israel as we look back on those moments. Uh, there are certain moments in life where people want to give us advice, right? People want to mentor you, tutor you at, the, at these uh, special moments. So uh, let's say like you graduate high school, people are going to start giving you advice for that moment that they probably haven't given you up to that time or they've waited for that moment or, you know, now it's time for you to go out and make your way in the world and you've got these choices ahead of you. And uh, maybe another moment would be uh, if you get married, people start giving you some, some marriage advice, you know, some, uh, some instruction on what's worked for them, what hasn't worked for them and what might work for you. And 
and, and some definitely don't do's uh, kinds of things. You start to get uh, that, uh, that advice, that instruction. When you have kids, people start to give you some advice, uh, some, in, some instruction. And, uh, and so there's these certain moments where the advice and the mentoring and the tutoring that you get right in that moment is really specific uh, to the time. Is there, a, is there a slide, Steve? They're not on the USB? They're not anywhere. All right, fun. Well, I know what I'm preaching. That's Exodus 8. It's the, it's the eighth sermon in the series. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we get advice at, at uh, just the right time when we need it. We've come out of the Passover moment, and there are three things in Exodus chapter 13. It's really easy just to jump from Passover to the Red Sea, like to the next dramatic moment. Uh, but there's three things in Exodus 13 that God wants his people to see and experience and recognize before we go on and talk about the Red Sea moment. So in Exodus chapter 13, let's read 1 through 10, and we'll see the first thing that God wants them to remember, <clears throat> to know after they've experienced the Passover. Exodus 13, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever's the first." To open the womb among the people of Israel, both man and of beast, is mine. So, uh, that's kind of like heavy for God to say, like, your firstborn son in this nation, for every family, belongs to me. And the firstborn of your livestock, right, from here on out, it belongs to me. So this is kind of the reciprocal side. It's the reverse of what happened at the Passover. What happened at the Passover? Everyone without faith, everyone who didn't put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, they lost their firstborn. And so God is saying, I've redeemed you from this place. I've taken you out of the slavery of Egypt, and I want you to remember this forever to the extent that your firstborn children, your firstborn sons, the firstborn of your livestock from now on, they, they belong to me. You consecrate them to me. Hey, there's our sermon. The leaven, the lamb, and the long way. All right. We're going to talk about the leaven. All right. So that's the first thing. This consecration of the firstborn. Uh, I don't know why this happens in Scripture. Uh, there's this moment to consecrate the firstborn, and then we're going to talk about the leaven uh, next. So remember at Passover, how do they make their bread? As quick as possible, right? Smack it down, dry it in the sun, bake it, and we're getting out of town. We're not waiting for our yeasty rolls to rise, all right. So no fluffy bread on uh, on Passover crackers only. Verse two, uh, verse three. Then Moses said to the people, "Remember this day, in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery. For by a strong hand the Lord brought you out from this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today, in the month of Abib, you are going out. And when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, the land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you. And no leaven shall be seen with you in all of your territory. You shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be a sign, uh, as, uh, and it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and a memorial between your eyes that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep the statute at its appointed time from year to year. So they've left Egypt in the Passover, they've got their unleavened bread, you know, they're, they're, they're moving along towards the Red Sea, and God interrupts to speak in this moment and says, I want you to consecrate your first, uh, firstborn, we're going to talk about that in the next paragraph, and then he says, before you start baking your rolls, all right, and rolling out your cinnamon rolls and kneading your dough, we're going to keep this unleavened bread thing going for the next week. So once you kind of learn your way around these feasts, and we'll get into, into this later on in the, in the book of Exodus, uh, you see that these two, piece, uh, two feasts go back to back. Passover is a one-day feast. That's kind of a celebration. You get to eat the lamb, you have family. Remember all that stuff we talked about with Passover? Good times, Passover. The next week, you continue in celebration, but this celebration is different than Passover because you continue on by eating that unleavened bread. So God wants 
us and his people to remember what happened in Egypt through that week when we eat this unleavened bread. So I think, we, uh, I think we're far enough in the notes where we can go ahead, uh, Steve. So after the one-day feast of Passover, there's a different kind of feast. It's kind of funny that the Bible calls this feast of unleavened bread a feast, right? For the next week, you get to eat crackers. <laughs> feast away, people, all right? Feast yourself on communion bread, all right? Have at it. Go dip your honey in it, your apples and whatever else, but you're eating the unleavened bread for the next week because God wants his people in that week to remember the slavery in Egypt, to remember that where they came from, remember God's hand, remember God's word through, through these moments. So uh, it's also awesome, too, just to remember that in Genesis 3, the first sin and temptation came from eating, right? from plucking, plucking fruit. It looked good. It was pleasing uh, to the eye. So God uses this same kind of idea in a moment of correction and in a moment, moment of, of remembrance. So after the one-day feast of Passover, there's a different kind of feast. This is a week of remembrance through limitation, all right? A week of remembrance through limitation. You could say it's a, a fasting of sorts, that for this one week coming up, this feast of unleavened bread, we're not eating yeasty bread. We're not eating grandma's biscuits. We're not eating the cinnamon rolls. We're staying away from all that, and we are instead eating this, uh, this um, unleavened bread. When we celebrate freedom, here's the purpose and the idea behind it. When we celebrate freedom, Exodus is the book of freedom, we must also be aware of how easy it is to fall back into the slavery of sin. So this might just sound like a calendar moment, like, hey, make sure every every year after Passover you continue unleavened bread for a week. No, (laughs) this right here is the theme for the next 20 chapters, okay? How easy it is to fall back into the slavery of sin. All right, they're leaving Egypt, right? We're getting past the county line, but guess what? (laughs) When they get to the Red Sea, what do they say? Man, Egypt was pretty good, wasn't it? All right, Terrible, how terrible it is when our minds are so twisted that we look back and say, you know, it really wasn't so bad. <laughs> it wasn't so bad being in, in bondage. It wasn't, it wasn't so bad. They had steak back there, all right? Pharaoh knew how to keep his people working, all right? Slavery with meat, right? Slavery with barbecue worked for the people of Israel. So this moment, this week of of feasting through limitation is just to remind them how easy it's going to be for each and every one of us to fall back into the slavery of sin, to fall back into an old pattern, to fall back into an old corrupt or doubtful or depressed way of thinking. It's going to happen at the Red Sea. They're going to get over that one. They're going to get to Mount Sinai where God told Moses, we're coming back to Sinai. We're going to have a covenant. Moses goes up to get the covenant documents from God. And what do they do down below? That golden calf we saw yesterday. Yesterday we saw a a herd of cattle and there was one golden one standing out between them. I said, boy, (laughs) he's the bad guy, right? He's, He's the first one to Whataburger. All right. I think Reggie said that out loud to him. I think he's this week of remembrance through limitation. Israel, and I have greater compassion in reading the Old Testament scriptures than I I used to read it and say, "Boy, they really messed up, right?" Man, I would I would never do that. <laughs> I don't say that anymore when I read the Old Testament. All right, I look at it and say, "Oh, I did that too." <laughs> It happens that we fall back into our old ways of thinking, fall back into old patterns of disbelief. Uh, The scriptures use this idea of the yeast, of the leavening, even though it's one of the smallest ingredients. You ever buy yeast packets at the store? You can hardly find them, right? This is like, they have to put three of them attached together just so you can even, you can even find the the yeast. So, but it's a small ingredient, but it, it, it makes a humongous, it makes all the difference between a cracker and, and, a, and a good Thanksgiving grandma's yeasty roll. So it's easy for us to fall back into this pattern. Luke chapter 2, verse 1, if you read along with me, Jesus said to his disciples first, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. So when Jesus calls out the Pharisees, he says, oh, their, their yeast, their leaven, their little thing is hypocrisy. So listen to their teaching, right? I mean, they got great ideas, good stuff, good content. Just watch out for their hypocrisy. So what's good for us to examine is what's like, what's the lump? What's the yeast in my life? 
What's the small amount of something that dishonors God? Where I've got everything else put together, but there's maybe still some doubt, maybe still some disbelief, maybe still some sin, maybe still some hidden part that I want to keep in my life where I'm saying, you know, it's really not that bad. (laughs) Really like hanging on to that. Really don't want to leave that behind. Uh, I see this in, in ministry and in and in ministers, just in this last year, I mean, a, a, a person in ministry that I've admired, ha- have his books, Ravi Zacharias. I mean, his, he passed away this last year, but like sadly in the last two years of his life, a whole bunch of leaven came to light in his life and in his ministry. And guess what? Like you quote him now, even though there's truth in the content, people know the hypocrisy. And that like pain, that pains me, you know, when somebody is done great work, like they've saved orphans in India, like they've done more on the ground for people. And we celebrate that work, and it's good work, but you bring up his name now, and everyone knows just the smallest little hidden sins of life, they come to light. And so for each one of us, it's good to go through this pattern that Israel goes through and say, I'm sweeping up my house. Not just sweeping up my house, what do they say? And all of your territory, all right? Make sure, like, you can't dump off your, you know, your, your Cheerios at your neighbor's house and say, you, you know, you have the leaven, all right? Out of the whole nation, let's sweep out the sin and the hypocrisy and the hiddenness of our lives. So unleavened bread uh, comes after Passover, and it's just a, a great way for God to continue on teaching his people that the hidden parts of our lives make a difference before God. He sees it, and he wants us to eliminate it. Now, the next paragraph goes back to this idea of the consecration of our firstborn. So let's look at verse 11. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. Or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. And when in time, uh, when the time comes, your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborns of my sons I redeem. It shall be as a mark on your hand or frontlets before your eyes, for by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. So the way, number one, that we remember the Passover is by this week of continuing uh, on in, in eating unleavened bread. And the second way that we remember is, is by the lamb itself. So uh, go ahead and go back, Steve. Um, so what we see in this moment is God says, your firstborn belong to me. Now, later on in Exodus, God's going to start talking about what's an acceptable temple sacrifice and what's not. All right, what you can eat and what you shouldn't eat. You don't bring to the temple as an offering something you can't eat. Right? So like, if you didn't want to eat it anyway, you can't just take it to the temple. Right? If it's some leftovers or somebody else's, if you can't just take it to the temple and give it to God, what you end up giving to God is something that you're looking at saying, you know what? <laughs> I would really like to have that for me. But God, I choose to give this to you. I desire to bless you with this. And most of the temple sacrifices went to feeding and fellowshipping with the priests who worked in the temple. Also, it didn't just all go burn in the fire. All right, so these are good offerings. They went to kind of make the temple function and to bless the priests and Levites and, and those who worked in, in the temple. So if you do have a donkey that's born, that's not a temple sacrifice, right? You don't, you don't eat your donkeys. Okay? They work. Um, it's not a temple sacrifice. So what can you do instead? You, you get to keep the donkey. He gets to work for you, or you can pet him, whatever you want. But you redeem its life with a lamb, because that is a, an acceptable temple offering. And also with your children, right? When you have a firstborn child, that is not an acceptable temple sacrifice. All right? This is probably not... Um, landing on us as heavily as it might to to those in the Old Testament. But at the same time, in Canaan, they were offering their children as as sacrifice to Baal and Molech. So, So when God says, your firstborn belong to me, and I want them to be alive, right, that's big. It's, it's huge. That's why there's this moment, before we get to Red Sea and before we go into the land, I need to teach you some things. 
when you see the Canaanites offering their children as, an, as a sacrifice, we don't do that. I want your firstborn, and I want to redeem it. So offer me a lamb in its place. The donkey, sadly, <laughs> if you don't want the donkey, and if you don't want to redeem it, you break its neck. No one wants to break the neck of their donkey. This is God's way of saying, you must offer to me something in its place if you choose to keep it. So you can see how heavy this is. Like God says, this matters. Your firstborn matters. Remembering the firstborn in the Passover, it matters. And so there's two things we can see this. I love reading through the uh, Old Testament scriptures with our eyes adjusted through the gospel because we can see that God values not just human life, but in all this talk of the firstborn, every time I hear firstborn, I think of God gave us his firstborn son. So two things that we can see here in this moment where God is, is, is talking about uh, the lamb and redeeming people. Number one, go ahead, Steve. Uh, God is willing to accept a substitution. Right, so when the, the donkey is born, you don't have to say, oh, sadly, we're losing, you know, little burrow. No, you get to keep the donkey. God is willing to accept a substitution. And this is going to go on throughout the law. Uh, God will say, you know, if you're, if you're bringing a praise offering for a, for a certain reason, then, uh, then, then bring a lamb. And if you don't have a lamb, then you can bring a goat. It's a little smaller. And if you don't have a goat, you could bring some pigeons. They're a little bit smaller. And if you don't have pigeons, then you can bring some flour. God says, just don't come empty-handed. Like, I've blessed you with something. Bring something in return. God is willing to accept a substitute whenever there is a, a need and when there's a moment of redemption. And then beyond that, what we see, which is really beautiful, is that God is willing to make that substitute his own son. It's like we can start to see this and say, oh, we understand the idea that God is willing to exchange one life for another. Instead of God saying, yeah, you were born, but there's sin in your life, and so we'll break your neck. God's substitute for us is that he's willing to place his own firstborn. Here's what's awesome about this. When you read through this, God is not asking his people to do anything that he has not already promised to do, right? It's like we can give our best offering because God has already given us his best offering. Like he's not a God who makes demands out of us that he's not also willing to live out in the flesh. So as we read through these passages, we see that God is preparing his people to understand and receive an offering of the firstborn. In fact, here's what Jesus and John the Baptist were both aware of as, uh, as their ministries began. In John chapter 1, verse 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In that verse right there is both the Lamb and the leaven. They're both in that same moment. So like, we're lost on this because we don't always celebrate these feasts and know this history, but to anyone who's celebrating Passover and celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when they hear John speak this way, they say, what? Exodus 13 means something today? <laughs> yes, there's a lamb who will redeem us from the leaven that remains inside of each one of us. So the gospel is being preached and presented and prepared for us all through these Old Testament books. And that's what I want to do as we get into these later chapters of, of the law and, and the feasts and all these ways that, uh, that God is teaching his nation. There's so many gospel uh, illustrations in there uh, that we'll be able to see. So there's the leaven, there's the lamb, and then finally we have kind of a, a narrator's uh, point to, to insert here into the history uh, before they start marching to the Red Sea. There's some purpose behind who God is and what he's doing. So let's look at verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. So the Philistines live on this west coast of the Mediterranean through the land of, of Israel. That would have been the quickest way, just as you're thinking on a map, right? Egypt to Israel, let's just go up the coast, right? And there's just a nice little, nice little hike right there. But God did not lead them that way through the land of the Philistines, even though that was near, even though that was close. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph, uh, Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. 
And they moved on from Succoth, and they encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, and that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. So a nice little note in there to remember. I was like, oh, remember Joseph? Remember generations ago that Joseph is the one who brought his family down here? Joseph had made them promise because he knew they were leaving. He knew that we weren't here forever. So he said, when you all pack up and leave, and you have that Passover and there's all that haste and all that stuff, please don't leave my bones here. (laughs) Our whole family were going back to where we came from. And so they remembered Joseph and they remembered God's word and God's promise. And so I think it's a beautiful, beautiful moment of uh, of just remembrance uh, there. But it's interesting to see that God could have taken them the close way, could have taken them the, the quick journey, but they weren't ready for it. And we see that they're not ready for it because when they get to the Red Sea, they're not even ready for that. <laughs> they think that God's going to drown them or smash them with Pharaoh's army in this, in this moment. So uh, I hate to make the argument like it could be worse. Um, this is not a very encouraging argument, but we'll frame it this way. Uh, God knows who you are. He knows what you're ready for. And he knows what you're not ready for. And he's not going to lead you to what you're not ready for. Isn't that better than saying it could be worse, (laughs) right? It could be worse, (laughs) but not with God. God could have led his people there and just like overwhelmed the Philistines. But the beauty of the book of Exodus, and this is why I have so much more compassion on them than than I probably did in Bible college reading this, is that there are children. They, they, like, they don't know anything about a temple or about the scriptures or about the word of God or redeeming lambs and donkeys and stuff. They are just learning. Right? They are just taking baby steps. And so you know, God looks at the big playground and says, no, baby, you're not ready for that. Let's go to Little Jungle Gym for the little, for the little kids. All right? I'm going to take you to the Red Sea. We're going to go make a covenant. We're going to take some baby steps together. And so praise God for his compassion on us and for walking with us and taking us the long way, taking us the slow way, and not leading us into the things that we're not ready for. Uh, so in your notes, you can, you can write it this way. When, uh, when life looks like a chapter between war and wilderness, right? here's your two options, all right? War, which you're not ready for. Uh, wilderness, which is not that scary. You just have to trust God. Sometimes life looks like a chapter in between these two places, but just know this, that God is near, that God has led Israel into these places. And there's a play on words happening here in in the text, in the grammar, where it says that the land that they were going to was near, but they weren't ready for it, so God took them to the far land, but he was near. You see the difference? Instead of going to the place that's close, he took them to the place that was far because what mattered most is that they knew that God was close. And if he took them to the close place and they saw war, they would say, God is not here, even though he would have been with them. When life looks like a chapter between these alternatives, don't just say it is worse or it could be worse. Say, God has led me here and he has been faithful to lead me to this place. He is near. What you have to do, though, is look for the pillars of God's leading. you got to look for the pillars in your life of God's leading. If you're looking for bad news, I have good news. (laughs) You'll find it. There's bad news out there. If you were looking for, you know, for something to complain about, if you're looking for indicators of God's absence, you can look around and and, and find it. It's It's in our attitude. But if you look for signs of God's goodness... If you look for signs of God's leading, if you look for signs of God's faithfulness, you'll find them. He'll make them present to you. I'll tell you two in my life, and they might not make sense to you at all, but they make sense to me, okay? Uh, Kim and I were at this, were you at the camp? Uh, I don't know if you were at the camp with me. Uh, There's a camp where we just ended up with a real severe uh, summer camp, Bible summer camp, Christian summer camp, and uh, ended up with a child, just some real severe needs, um, had some some, uh, some self-harm issues. And so I'm like, uh, God, I'm not prepared <laughs> as a 25-year-old youth minister to, to deal with this stuff. Fortunately, my, my co-camp director had just retired from servicing like the mental health division of a children's hospital, all right? So maybe that means something to you. It meant 
like my career, right? Like, <laughs> if I lose a kid at summer camp, like, that's, that's not good, you know? And so, it's like, that, that was huge. So, in the middle of, like, that war and that wilderness, uh, I walk out from the cafeteria where we're talking to the student, talking to the hospital, and I walk outside, and we're in, a, uh, we're in the Palo Duro Canyon. Tommy knows exactly where, where I was. Um, we're in this canyon, and I look outside, and there's a full moon with no clouds, no stars in the sky, right? It's like this, and I'm in a canyon where you're farther away from things in space, but the moon was like so close. So again, probably doesn't mean anything to you, but to me, that was just like a sign of God's presence. Ah, I shouldn't tell these stories, right? Uh, just a sign of God's presence, like I'm close. It wasn't a pillar of fire. It wasn't cloud. It's just the moon, <laughs> which is there all the time, all right? But to me, in that moment, it was everything. Uh, I'll give you one that's not so weepy, all right? Uh, I do kayak a lot with, uh, with Reggie and Kenny and, and Gary and, and Heidi and some other people, Tommy also. Um, I, I take pictures sometimes as we go out. One thing that I find fascinating uh, when we kayak around is sometimes you see a tree that is hanging on to the bank. Like, I take pictures of these, all right? Uh, you see a tree that has no business still standing, Right? There's no dirt left around it. Some of them are even dead. One of those ones we saw yesterday is a massive maple tree. We're like, man, that's a humongous tree. It's dead, but it's just still there hanging on. So I take pictures all the time of these trees on the water line that, I mean, maybe someday they'll eventually you know, make their way into the water and fall down. But I see these trees that are just hanging on, and they're just this awesome, to me, just uh, an illustration of like, we are meant to hang on. Like, we're not meant to to die, to cripple in place, or fall down, or, or be defeated. But just, I mean, if trees can hang on, right, if we can hang on. And we have brains and trees don't, so maybe they have an advantage that we don't have, right? But in all the ups and downs in life, here's what I know. The ups and downs of our emotions are so much greater than the real ups and downs. Does that make sense? The, the real ups and downs really, as you read through this, are not as big as the emotions ups and downs of Israel. They worship God one minute, they reject him the next. They're full of praise one moment, they're crippled in the next. And so look for the pillars of God's leading because he's so faithful and he's so present in our, all of our lives. Uh, we'll uh, finish with Psalm 22, uh, verse 24. This is Jesus on the cross. He says these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if you turn to that Psalm, Psalm 22, and read through, you see the next portion of the thought because David does start the Psalm by saying, God, God, why have you forsaken me? But as he looks through life, he recognizes, these are just my emotions. <laughs> my emotions go up and down and say, you've forsaken me. But by the time he thinks about it and gets to verse 24, he says this, For he has not despised or hated me in my affliction, and he has not hidden his face from me. But he has heard when I cried to him. That's the truth. Sometimes we'll say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's war and there's wilderness. There's difficulty. But in time, you'll look back at that moment with this attitude and say, God, you did not forsake me then. You were present in my time of trouble. Uh, we're going to close by taking communion uh, together. So if you want to grab the communion elements for those of you who are uh, here uh, in the room, I'll share uh, just one thought as we, as we prepare to take this. Uh, as Jesus had this bread and this cup that he shared with his disciples, they were celebrating the Passover meal. So the Passover meal is that one night, and what comes up for the next week? The Feast of Unleavened Bread. So Jesus says something really, really interesting to his disciples, right? He takes the bread, he blesses it, he breaks it, they pass it around, and he says, whenever you eat this bread, think of me. What are they doing for the next week? Eating this bread. All right, so hopefully... When we eat this bread, whatever comes our way in the next week, we remember the God who's faithful with us. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took a cup. He blessed it and shared it with his disciples and said, This is my blood which is poured out for your sins. Take this in remembrance of me. The scriptures tell us when we eat this bread and drink this cup. We proclaim the Lord's death 
until he returns. We'll close in prayer, and then I'll make one last announcement. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your great faithfulness in our lives, Lord, that you have pillars of cloud by day and pillars of fire by night to keep us satisfied, to keep us protected, to keep us uh, in, in, in our walk, in our relationship, in lockstep with you. God, help us in the times where our emotions rage, where our senses rage. Lord, uh, help us uh, calm us down. Lord, walk with us as we do our children. Uh, Lord, to, uh, to soothe us, to comfort us, to strengthen us and prepare us for what lies ahead. Lord, help us to be salt and light into this world. Lord, help us to be a, a force for good and positive and for change in this world. Lord, help us to remember all that you have done in the past. We love you and we praise your name today in Christ's name. Amen. We'll uh, stand together and close uh, with, a, uh, with a blessing for today. Uh, we do have a, a church uh, fellowship uh, lunch coming up on May 2nd, so check your email. You can find out uh, what you can sign up to, to bring. We're going to do that out on the, on the front lawn, uh, so we've got that coming up in, uh, in just a couple weeks. Uh, let's stand together and uh, share in this blessing. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him.